Footballers' Lives with Richard Lenton is brought to you by the Phoenix Sport and Media Group. Hello and welcome to Footballers' Lives, the podcast series where I'll be digging out my old contacts book and having a chat with former footballers who I've met along my magazine editing and television presenting journey here in the UK and out in Asia where I presented Premier League football for many, many years. Today's guest is Michael Thomas, along with Sergio Aguero, is the scorer of the joint most famous goal in English club football history. Arsenal comes streaming forward now in surely what will be their last attack. A good ball by Dixon, finding Smith, for Thomas, charging through the midfield, Thomas, it's up for grabs now, Thomas, right at the end. Friday, May the 26th, 1989, it feels like yesterday in many ways, but Mickey's iconic title winner for Arsenal against Liverpool at Anfield came at a time when the game was very, very different indeed. It was before all the fanfare generated by Italian 90 and the advent of the Premier League, And it was on the final day of a season that was marred, of course, by the tragedy of Hillsborough. Now, I first met Mickey back in 2010 in Grenada, of all places. I've been invited out there by the Jason Roberts Foundation for a Liverpool Legends trip. The Liverpool Legends were doing some charity work out in the Caribbean and I was covering it. It was a five-star hotel on the beach in Grenada, all expenses paid. And I'm sharing this resort and having some wonderful times with these Liverpool players who I'd grown up watching. But the culmination of the trip was going to be a match in the National Stadium against the Grenada All-Stars team that included Jason Roberts himself, one or two other ex-professional footballers, and the late Cyril Regis. But John Barnes had pulled out of the trip at the last minute. He'd got the Tranmere Rovers manager's job. So I'm looking around as I'm enjoying this five-star luxury. I'm thinking, well, Liverpool have only got 10 players. Uh, And I knew that they were going to get some former West Indian cricketers to make up the squad numbers for this big game in the National Stadium. But I thought to myself, well, I wouldn't mind getting involved here. And Phil Thompson was the manager. And the Liverpool players were having to do a lot of charity work with kids out in Grenada, which involved coaching sessions, etc. And bearing in mind, I was in my mid-30s by then. I got my boots out and I started joining in with these kids and I started telling Phil Thompson, look, I can do a little bit. You know, why don't you at least get me in the in the squad so I can see what it's all about? And it will add to the magazine feature. So on the day of the game, I'm invited to the National Stadium. All of a sudden, I'm in the dressing room with these lads. And they're all preparing like it was a proper, proper game. So you've got Bruce Grobbler with a towel over his head. You've got players getting massages. They're going through their pre-match routines and taking it very, very seriously. So then Phil Thompson gathers everyone together and he says, right, here's the team. He's gone. Bruce Grobble are in goal. Rob Jones right back. Phil Babb left back. Gary Gillespie and Mark Wright centre halves. Mark Walters out on the left-hand side of midfield. Michael Thomas and Jason McAteer in the middle. He's gone, Rich, can you do a job on the right-hand side of midfield? I thought, well, I play centre midfield normally, but go on, I'll swallow that, you know, seeing as Mickey Thomas and Jason McAteer might have done a little bit in the game. But there you go. All of a sudden, we had Paul Walsh up front as well. So all of a sudden, we're going out uh, into the National Stadium. There's 4,000 people out there. And then this fella gets onto this rickety old music box and he says, right, time now for the National Anthems. First, the National Anthem of Liverpool. So obviously, I'm expecting God Save the Queen. And then this fella starts singing, when you walk through a storm, hold your head. It was just the most surreal moment of my life. And I ended up having a reasonable game. I set up a goal. I hit the bar in the first few minutes. It was was absolutely living the dream. But a decade after that, the finest moment of my incredibly undistinguished football career, I finally caught up with the subject of this podcast, Mickey Thomas, to talk about his career in the game. Enjoy. Okay, Mickey. Thank you for joining us. I think most football fans would imagine that after your playing days were over, you'd have gone back and settled in your old manor in in London. But you settled, uh, you're settled. up in Liverpool around the Wirral, aren't you? I'm afraid so, yeah. I would have, uh, would have loved to um, settle down south, but my wife and family didn't, didn't like the south. She's a northerner. So um, what, what can we say? Just got to get on with it, really. You know, I love, love, I'll still love it up there. I love it up in the, in the world. You know what I mean? Best of both worlds beach, yeah. countryside, what more do you want? 
And you've got plenty of space up there. And I think a few old Liverpool lads ended up settling up there. I think, obviously, I think John Barnes is up there, isn't he? You know, and he was yeah. he, obviously another London lad by Jamaica. Incy. In- Incy's up there. Paul Incy's up there. So, yeah, it's, it's a nice place to live. Rafa's still there. Rafa Benitez, so what more do you, <laughs> you know, all these journeys of managerials, managerials, uh, managing teams, he still stayed there. His wife still stayed there. There must be something about the place that just keeps you there, that just draws you in. It's just a chilled out little like, peninsula, really. You know, you know you've got the Hoy Lake Golf where Tiger won his, his first uh, only British Open. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the, um, only, the only open, because I work for a golf magazine with your old football, yeah. with your old Liverpool mate, Phil Babb, of course. Oh, I work for golf. Exactly. And the only open championship I went to was uh, 2008, which was the only one he never went to. He was injured, wasn't he? Well, so, yeah. well seriously, I'm, I'm sure. When he won it, when he won it. The... No, 2008, he... Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure he won it. He was there. I remember, I remember being... I'm sure I remember being with you. Down in the on the docks with Babsy and that the golf punk. No, that was a different one. Two thousand eight was Southport, and um, he, oh. he didn't play. Oh. He was injured, and Greg Norman was winning after three rounds. Yeah. And then Padre Harrington came along and uh, won that. Apologies oh. for that noise, by the way. That they are my cats fighting, which is uh, <laughs> never good. Hopefully they'll shut up in a minute. But Mickey, right? I want to take you back to the goal that I know that you treasure more than any other, and I think people uh, may be quite surprised at this because they'll be thinking I'm talking about one of the most iconic goals in football history, which I'm sure we'll touch upon later. But I think I'm right in saying the most treasured goal that you scored was the 1992. FA Cup final. So why would you put that maybe above the famous Arsenal goal? Well, people of my generation, I don't know if you're in that category yet, you tell me. Uh, <laughs> we always dreamed of scoring an FA Cup final goal when we were younger with all your mates, you know. Uh, you know, thinking about those cup final, every cup final time, the, the build-up for the whole week was like game shows, you know, quiz, and everybody watched them Watch them all, you know, and then the day of the game, you, you never leave the house all morning because you watched every minute on the TV from eight o'clock in the morning till when it finished. And then you'll all be, see your mates at the end of it, come play, you know what I mean? Play, it's a knockout in the you know, FA Cup final or whatever you want to play. So for me, that was the best, you know, always, I've dreamt, you know. You dreamt of that for, from a young age. So- so they were, that was back in the days when, obviously, there was that big, massive TV build-up all day. So who were you rooming with the night before the 92 final? Let me just remind people, by the way, Liverpool won that game against a Sunderland side who got you there against kind of all odds. So 2-0 <laughs> against Sunderland. Who were you rooming with? Can you remember? I can't remember. Could, could have been Barnsley, but I can't remember anything of that final that, that, you know, that, that week. I can't remember anything about it. I remember the, the other one in 96, but... This, that one, I cannot remember. Right. So it all just went by in a bit of a blur. So you mentioned quiz shows and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you forget, you know, we, were, we only had three, I think we only had four channels back then, didn't we? we four main channels. Sky was very much in its infancy. What, what were some of the quiz shows that the players were having to oh, appear on? It's, it's a knockout. Um, uh, what was it? It's a knockout was definitely on, um, I'm trying to think what it's called now. Squares, one of the squares when the people in... Blankety blank. Blankety blank, it was, you know, things like that. It, oh, it was brilliant. It was brilliant, you know. And then you just think about um, is the TV guys outside the hotels trying to get an interview and watch them walking down by the river or whatever in the morning just for a walk. Just, you know, it was, it was great. It was great to see behind the scenes. And then you get to a kind of pre-match meal in the hotel. What was your, what was your pre-match meal? Because this is 28 years ago. Are we, are we talking steak and chips? Or? Uh, no. The only, time, the only time I saw steak and chips was when I came, when I came to Liverpool. Even at Arsenal, mine was... Uh, we, we never had steak and chips because George Graham got rid of all that. All of all that kind of food. We, um, we had scrambled eggs. I had scrambled eggs on toast and beans. That was my, that was my norm, my go-to. Nice and light. Always. And a solid mix of protein and carbs as well. You could, got, there there was a few up. players who had, you know, I mean, who had steak, you know, at Liverpool, you know, and... Uh, uh, well, lads, they're having steak before the final. I would have thought so. Yeah. They, they were used to that. 
steak, uh, chicken, a whole chicken. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah, a little bit different. I don't think Arsene Wenger would love that. Especially once, you know, especially at 12 o'clock, eating at 12 o'clock. Yeah. You know. but, but going back to that, the build-up to the final, it must have been a bit of a strange one because Graeme Sooners had just had triple heart bypass surgery, hadn't he? So I know Ronnie Moran led you out for the final. But what was it like in the kind of week before before the game? Was Ronnie doing all the coaching and, and sessions? Well, Ronnie just... It, it, uh, Liverpool way so famous around the world. Five sides, that's all we've done, five sides. We'll all do five sides and set pieces every day. A bit of shooting. So that would always be the same. Five sides, eight side. We just call it five side, but it's eight side or whatever. Seven aside. Um, but with conditions in the game, one touch, two touch, you know. Only pass forward, um, so yeah. It, but it'd just be the same to the, any other any other game. They just made it sh- make it you know, sound simple, you know. Don't make the game bigger than what it is, and, this, and that's, that was Liverpool's way. And so. massively different then to what you'd have been used to at Arsenal, which I imagine were lots of drills, especially defensive drills. Yeah. under George Graham. But I, I, as a player, did you really enjoy the training at Liverpool then? Or, or were you thinking, this isn't quite right, there's a bit missing here? No, um, I, I loved it. I did love it. But um, I still think you need to learn about the tactical awareness of the game. But George was brilliant at tactical awareness of games, you know, um, deploying teams' weaknesses. Liverpool was never like that. They just played their, you play your game and that's it. Don't worry about them. They have to worry about you. Um, but then we just obviously do set pieces. We learn trying to do some set pieces for corners against and stuff like that. But no, mm. I enjoyed it very much. So I, yeah. I became a young kid again playing at Liverpool. Yeah, I suppose it kind of goes goes back to basics, doesn't it? You know, and I, I suppose scoring that goal in the FA Cup final was the kind of culmination of that dream and that long football footballing journey that had begun sort of 25 years previously. So what was it like growing up in Lambeth? Was it, was it a case of you were just out there playing football all the time? And... Yeah, I think, it, I think it's the same around the, around the country. I think mean, around the world, probably. You, you get up early in the morning. If you ain't got school, you make sure you're downstairs early to get on and play football with your, with your mates. And whatever's, <laughs> whatever's last is going in goal. So, yeah. You know, and if you didn't find any mates, you're just practising non-stop with your skills against the wall. That's how you learn, you know, you learn your trade. And that was, that was me. No different than anybody else, really. Um, no, I absolutely loved it. it and were you growing up, did you grow up alongside any other players who, who kind of made a living in the professional game? Uh, a schoolboy, obviously, schoolboy, definitely. Um, in my South London team was um, David Rowcastle, my old teammate. So David came through with me at Arsenal. He was the first, he went in the first team before me, which I loved. Um, and then on my county side, there was Dennis Wise. So Wise was in that team. I'm trying to think who else was in that team. And then the Greater London team, I think it was the Dame Tony Adams. You know, so there was players around there. Yeah. Definitely, and obviously Paul Lentz, he was playing. So yeah, like, it was good. It was so good. Plenty of talent kicking around. Oh, there's plenty of talent in London. There's a lot of talent in London. I think there still is. It's about where there's talent all over. It's how you nurture it, more importantly, how you nurture it, you know, in England. In the old days, sometimes they knock it out of you. You had all the talent and they'll try and knock it out of you, coach it out of you, you know. Like players like Ian Wright, it's fantastic for them to come into the game very late because they've got that rawness and they've still got that hunger and enjoyment of the game. But when you came through the ranks, sometimes you lose that because you started so young, you know. So Sometimes it's tough. And did you have good mentors around you? You know, family? Uh, yeah, my family were all supportive. Very supportive. Um, very much supported. I had a teacher who was very supportive. Um, but yeah, everybody was supportive at the time. Um, and I just, obviously, I had a young family as well, starting out in the game. 19 and I'm a dad. I'm like, wow, what's going on? <laughs> Jeez. But, uh, what was that? What was that like then? I, di- I didn't realize you were quite that young when you when you started a family. I mean, yeah, yeah, you were just was, making your way in the game. I mean, that was that must have been just as you were on the verge of making your debut for us. Yeah, it was, it was before that. Yeah, I was like, wow, 
I came back from an England youth uh, tournament in China before China was massive like it is now. China was, I was like, I was in Beijing and it was dirt, dirt, it was just dirt. I won't say dirty, but dirt. It was like, it was crazy. And on that, uh, I came back from there next minute. Um, I got the old call for, I was going to split with my girlfriend and she told me to come and see her. And then that's when I sort of found out. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mad, it is mad. So it was mad. Of, no. yeah. So it was a case of grow, having to grow up rather quickly. Did it also very work? quickly, very quickly. You know, going down to Oxford to see <laughs> to see to see the little all the time, and then obviously I moved into London. We got back together. Let's try to start something off again. So, so you were very much a hands-on dad at nineteen twenty. You must have yeah. thought it was just absolute. You, you must have wondered what on earth you you'd kind of got into. It must have all been a bit. Exactly. And when, especially when people like ask us, put us, oh, you were there when the drinking was going on and the Tuesday club was going on. I was like, uh, no, I'm, I was a young dad. I was gone. I was gone to Oxford or I was gone uh, to South London home with the family. There's not a chance I was uh, joining that Tuesday club. Well, it saved your liver and your wallet a little bit then, I suppose. <laughs> I had nothing in the wallet, so it didn't matter. <laughs> oh, uh, the liver is just getting used to it now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, think it, I, I honestly didn't realise it was that young. Because I think, I think you'd just been on loan at Portsmouth, hadn't you, at that kind yeah. of time? So you were just learning your football yeah. trade. And, and you, were re- you were seriously considering going to Portsmouth full-time, weren't you, before you'd made your Arsenal debut? Exactly. 17, 18, did enjoy my football. Um, Donnell was manager then, um, before I went to Portsmouth. And I wasn't enjoying it on Donnell and John Cartwright, more, more likely. I didn't like the way John Cartwright wanted us to play. And me, especially, just, just lump the ball forward. You know, I was never brought up that way to just lump the ball forward. I wanted to play. And um, so when they got the sack, Donnell got the sack, John Cartwright went, George came. Um, for the first three months, we didn't, me and George didn't get on. So, <laughs> like the rest of them. Um, then I went on loan, and I didn't want to come back. So when I, when I did come back, I said to George, I want to leave. And George was like, you're going nowhere. You're going nowhere. So I was like, oh. Yeah. So George had obviously seen something in you that he really liked then. I think he's, yeah, he's, seen, he's, known, he's known about, he's always known about the young talent we had at Arsenal. He's going to use, you know, work that to his favour. But I was, in the, I was the last one to get in the team at the time. Um, in my era of my players, Merson's younger, younger than me. So it was like David Rocastle, Martin Age, Gus Caesar, um, now Quinn, uh, Tony Adams. They all went, and Martin Keogh, they all got in the team earlier. So I was the last one of that generation to get in. So it was like... I but I suppose that, that spell at Portsmouth would have stood you in good stead. I know you only played a few games, but... It, you know, actually making a first team debut at that slightly lower level, uh, you know, and getting in amongst it, I'm, I'm sure it would have been quite character building. I, I looked at some of the names that you've been playing with, you know, your Noel Blakes, your Mickey Quinns, and your Paul Mariners. It would have, it was a proper experience. It was, it was an all sorts team, by the way. They didn't muck about. They looked after me really well. I must say, and it was a championship I was playing in, not like the third division or fourth, but I was in a championship with, under Alan Ball. You know, so the great Alan Ball. And look at that team. They had, as you said there, Paul Mariner, Vince Hilaire I used to watch as a kid at Palace. Uh, Billy Gilbert I used to watch. Um, uh, Tatey. Uh, Callaghan. He used, uh, used to be at Ipswich. Yeah, Kevin O'Callaghan. He was actually in the film Escape to Victory, wasn't he? And he was the character who had his arm broken on purpose, by the way, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. to make their escape. Exactly. Then you had, you know, Mickey Kennedy, madman, madman, Dylan. It was a, it was a mad, mad time. Out there. You know, you had a crazy gang at Wimbledon, but these guys were worse than a crazy gang. They, they don't took them no prisoners. Those was phew, on the pitch. Everybody was scared of them. You know, they were mad. Well, it was a time when at that, you know, in that second division, people were kicking lumps out of each other to, to get out of that league, weren't they? So, so that's a tough place to go and make your first team debut, isn't it? Yeah, it was. 
you know, especially at, Port, uh, at Pompey, the pitch wasn't the best. In those days, most pitches were like mud, mud patches. You know, the only bit of greenery was on the, on the, on the, on the wings. So I was quite lucky I'd been a fullback. <laughs> I was like, uh, I saw, saw grass. <laughs> but, you know, if you look at the old videos, wow. The clips of the mud. Even in, the, even in the then First Vision or Premier League, the pitches were just like mud. You know, the players of today, they're playing bowling greens. It's crazy, you know, yeah. crazy. It's why, it's why it annoys me when people say automatically that Messi's a better player than Maradona. You know, you look at yeah. the pitches Maradona had to play on and the fact yeah. that people were allowed to just, you know, commit GBH on him. Oh, oh it's, it's, yeah, exactly. That's why, you know, I love Messi to the best of everything, but Maradona, for me, to leave Barcelona, go to a small club like Napoli at the time, and make them great. No one's ever going to do that again. No one's going to do that. No. Yeah. You got to, you know, they were a nothing team, weren't they? But yeah. let, let's go back to your, your childhood again in, in Lambeth. Uh, you know, I don't think many people know that you were actually... Uh, Lambeth. Lambeth, Stockwell, sir. Stockwell. Or Stockwell. As, a one, as a posh ones call it, St. Ockwell. <laughs> so St. Ockwell first. And then, uh, and then a bit of Lambeth. Uh, but you were a Tottenham fan, which many people will be surprised by. Did you, did you actually go to games or was it too difficult as a young black lad going on, on the terraces at that time? Was it, was it you know, just a place you didn't want to be? Think about it. My first game with my mates, I went to Chelsea. Ooh. And I was in a shed. And I was only about 11 then. 10, I think it must have been 10, 11. I went to Chelsea. And we were skinheads and the... NF leaflets, giving them out outside the ground, you know, and I'm at, at Chelsea with my mates going, you know, I had about two games on the shed, went, I'm not sitting here, just go to the benches instead. <laughs> so, and that, yeah, that was, you know, it was terrible. I remember, I think the first game was, um, was seeing Ron Harris's last game for Chelsea, I think it was against Burnley, their last game in the, in the second division at the time. So, yeah. I went to Chelsea. I used, to start, I used to love watching football. That was my thing. I love football to, the, to this day. You know, I went to go and watch Wimbledon. I was at Wimbledon. Palace, I liked Palace at the time. Venable, Venable's team. Yeah, I mean, it was just great to, you know, to go and watch football live instead of on the telly. And then I got into Spurs, 80s. Archibald and Crooks. That's when I got into them. Loved watching them. And my idol was uh, Hoddle. Glenn Hoddle, you know, if, if, for every black person, Hoddle was the player because he played like he was playing in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in our pen or on the, with the lads. He just enjoyed himself, so much skill, you know. He played his way, no one else's way, his way. I think it's absolutely criminal that I think he only won, what, 53 England caps. And when I, whenever I watched him, you know, he was just being... He was just being bypassed, you know. He should have been really looked after as a player, shouldn't he? It was never that way, though, in England. You know, I tried to, tried to school, tell my friends about... Uh, I watched the game so intimately abroad and, and here. And at that time, you always knew the difference. The teams that played good football at the time, passing game, when the players come into England, they couldn't play it. Like the Barneses, the Manamans, the Huddles, because the, the, the different... Different setup of of football, it's like long long ball over the top. It's, abroad, you play everyone plays the same way. You see, so it's easy to just walk into the, into the team. It's adjust. It's easy to adjust. In England, you don't know if you can go for you can go for get a pass. It goes over your head. But uh, you know, what I mean, and that's what Huddle's always getting it short, short from in Tottenham. Barnes was getting it all the time at Liverpool. It's one touch, two touch, quick. It's all move, quick moving football. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I don't think, yeah. I always think it's a problem adjusting to that kind of way. We're doing it now. We're all playing, trying to play the same way now, so it's easier. Yeah, mm. but maybe maybe we've gone too far in the fact that you know it takes away the kind of maverick players. It, it, you know, if you've gone through an academy system, do you think that's that's a real problem now? It's almost like a one size fits all scenario. Well, some of it, some of them are good. Some of the academies are good. Some of them are not. Uh, look at Jordan Sancho. He's come through the academy. He's still got his rawness about him, which I love. Um, 
what Sterling's come through the academy. He's doing really well. You can't, yeah, some academies are great. Um, Harry Kane, they all come through the academy. It's how they've, how they've been coached, really, more than importantly, how they've been coached. You hear the same old thing about, um, they will say, if you're good enough, you're, you'll play, like in Barcelona. Barcelona, their method is all about bringing their own through. Doesn't matter, they buy players, but they're bringing their own through. In England, if you can just buy, buy, buy. If you get one through, you're lucky. Yeah. You know? Well, that so. was always the uh, criticism of, um, of Mourinho, wasn't it? But I, what was it like in terms of coming through a professional football club system as a youth when you did it compared to now? And how come you ended up at Arsenal? Were there other kind of suitors looking at you as well? Yeah, well, I went around the country after playing for England schoolboys. I was invited to go around the country, different clubs, just go on trial, see if I liked it or to want, to want to sign you as a schoolboy. And at that time, I think it's the same now, I think. Yeah. You, have to, you sign by 15 to be a schoolboy and then you're at that club forever until 16 or whatever, you know, basically. And they got the choice of being an apprentice. Um, I didn't want to do that because at the time, my, my family were, were, I think, no uh, dinner money and, you know what I mean, pocket money, I should say, pocket money, not dinner money, pocket money. Um, so I was training at different clubs throughout the week. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting pocket money for, like, the expenses. So if the if the boss is cost me a pound, I'm writing two pound fifty. You know what I mean? So hey, I'm making sure. <laughs> um, but no, I was at Palace for a while. Wimbledon, I loved Wimbledon at the time. Dario Grady, Dario Grady was there, um, and and I read, and Harry Bassett obviously is, is number two. Loved it there. Um, so what made you sign for Arsenal then? What was the big factor? Arsenal was a uniqueness about it. Arsenal, I didn't know many people went to Arsenal, to be honest. When you, you, you're playing around, when you're playing in the schoolboy area, you didn't find no one, you didn't know no one who went to Arsenal who played at Arsenal. It was quite it was like, wow. And, you know, and then when I went there, my first training session, I'm in the dressing room, and then David Rowcastle walks in. And I've been playing this, I've been playing with David. In district side. So I'm like, huh? I can't believe he didn't say nothing about Arsenal at all. Never said nothing about him training at Arsenal. And Arsenal at that time was always about um, like picking the best players. So if they had three, four good, great players at that one age group, they would work with them, just work with that four as an apprentice or whatever. And then move the other kids up to play that, as a team. So they just wanted, you know, and they had great coaches as well at that time. So Terry Burton was a great coach. Tom Coleman, really good coach. Bob Wilson used to coach the schoolboys. No, it was, it was fantastic. It was like, wow, it's a place to be. Place yeah. to be. With other clubs, I had about, you could have 20 kids of one age group or more. I went to Tottenham at 15. I went to, went to the gym, couldn't move. It was ridiculous. I had one session and left. Yeah, yeah, but, and you mentioned um, Rocky Roca Rocastle. I remember watching him as a as a kid, and I thought he was an absolute Rolls Royce of a footballer. And then, you know, his, his career just seemed to seem to peter out. What? And then, obviously, sadly, died at such a tragically young age. I mean, what what do you think looking back on on Rocky's football career? Oh, it's a shame, really. Uh, really, sh you know, really sad that he hit the height so young, and done so well. Um, then he had the knee injury at Arsenal in 91 and that caused him a lot of problems if you look at the, um, the games he played in 91 when he won the, when he won the championship again um, that's because of his knee injury operation um, but then he was doing well he'd come back stronger than ever I left and he was come back stronger than ever then I was on the pre-season with Liverpool I was in Paris and then Graham Sunis goes Pulled me aside and goes, uh, your mate, have you heard the news? And, and I'm like, what are you on about, my mate? What? He's like, Dave Rocastle gone to Leeds for two million. It's like, wow. Especially as rightly just gone back, gone there. You know what I mean? Just to be with David. And so it was like, oh, oh what next? What am I going to do? 
So it was at Leeds, and it, at least he didn't get a game. I don't know why Howard Wilkinson bought him. He just didn't play him. I was like, what was the point of that? Yeah. And then Graham Sooners tried to swap him with Paul Stewart to go from you know, Leeds to Liverpool. And I was like, oh, I was like, oh, imagine Rockies are coming to Liverpool. Imagine that. Oh, it'd be brilliant. It'd be brilliant. And obviously, Paul Stewart won't go the other way. So it didn't happen. So. Yeah. But then he, he went to Man City, done really well in Man City. He got the move to Chelsea, played well in Chelsea. And then Rude Hullet, for like a Rude Hullet. Or Rude had, a, had something against David. And then um, that was it. He was on alone at Hull and then Barnet. And it was a sad way, like, you know, to end his career is it that way, really. Yeah, I remember him trying but, to kind of scratch it, you know, try and get a club out in Malaysia and, and Singapore, but I think his knee had properly gone by then. So, yeah, it, it, it just didn't quite happen for him. But, you know, he shone very brightly for, for maybe a little bit longer than what I initially thought. Maybe it was into his late his, his late 20s. But was he involved on your Arsenal debut? Because you made your Arsenal debut, didn't you, in the League Cup semi-final against Spurs of all teams? Yeah, but well, he was playing. It's a funny thing. He was playing. I was on the bench. And Gus Hughes was playing right back. I think Viv was injured or suspended. I don't know what Anderson was doing. And Gus was playing. Um, what does what there was giving him a hard time? <laughs> like what does every every fullback? And then last ten minutes, George put me on. I was like, ah, wow! Last ten minutes against Tottenham. Tottenham were rampant, you know, and Clive Allen scoring and causing chaos. Uh, so that was nice, 10 minutes. <laughs> and I thought, if I could do it in 10 minutes, I've cracked it. You know, if I can handle 10 minutes and against Chris Waddle, it shouldn't be a problem. And were you a natural right back or were you a converted full back? No, I was a natural right back. That's what everybody forgets. I came to Arsenal as a full back. As I was Arsenal as a full back. Um, I played for England, um, schoolboys, two years on a trot, as a right back and a left back. So, and I was a captain of England schoolboys. So, and at Chelsea, I was a midfield player. So it was like, mm, you know, it's the same for Arsenal. They said it was going to be a right back. Then they said, Wolf Dixon goes, hopefully in the youth games, we're going to put you to midfield so you can see what the whole, see the whole game. We know you can read the game. Once we want to see you in midfield. Never happened until George came and done it. It's quite weird, really. Well, it is because in that era, I mean, that was obviously the era I was playing, uh, coming through as a youth footballer. And I used to play central midfield. But then when I went up the levels, I had to play fullback because I wasn't good enough as a central midfielder. So for you to go the other way, just seemed completely (laughs) opposite of what everybody did at the time. Most fullbacks were failed wingers or failed midfielders. As a young kid, I was start, start, start off at centre half, centre centre forward, scoring lots of goals. First year at school, then I went to right wing, then I went to midfield, then I went. I got bored. I went to fullback. It was weird. That's <laughs> and then went back up again. So it was, that's how it worked out. It was crazy, you know. And as a fullback, I was always attacking. Well, that's what I was going to say, because in, in that first full season you had, you won the League Cup in, you know, in, in 87, didn't you? And you'd only been a, you'd only been a first-team player for five minutes. And then the yeah. following season, you had pretty much a full season at fullback. And I, I just, I couldn't believe it. I read it yesterday. You scored nine league goals. I thought attacking fullbacks were a modern phenomenon, Mickey. No, mate, we was always doing it. Because remember, Kenny Sampson was, in David, Derek Statham was the original fullbacks on the forward. And Viv Anderson. Viv. <laughs> It was always galloping down the wing. So from you know, I've, I my my idol was Viv, and then obviously got older. Leandro of Brazil, I loved Leandro playing in my position in that eighty two team. So it was like, oh man, it's just crazy, you know. It's and then one of these Barnsley, Barnsley rinsed Leandro for the goal <laughs> when he scored it. <laughs> well, he rinsed more than Leandro, didn't he? Kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well. But it's one of the, it's yet another modern misconception, isn't it? That the attack and, attacking fullback uh, know, yeah. was that's invented right. like most things after the Premier League. Yeah, that's what I just laugh. The media is like, oh, oh, attacking fullbacks, it's been there from day one. Attacking fullbacks, they've always been there from Brazil, from everywhere. Every bombing down a wing, yeah. scoring goals. That was, uh, 
Jossie um, Marr, of course, yeah. But, I mean, did it feel like big things were happening then at Arsenal, sort of that? Obviously, you won the League Cup, that late 80s period un, under George. And how big an influence was George? George was a massive in, influence. I, I always say to people, um, my education was really at Arsenal, as in tactical awareness of, of things. Donnell was really good, but I didn't play under Donnell, so I don't know what our tactical awareness he was. Um, but George was second to none. Oh, every detail he knew. He was, like, he was the original Mourinho. He, he knew everything about the team. He had, a, he, had his, like, he had a paper like that, and he'd go, right, he goes, right, we've got a team. I know what they're doing. Set pieces, whatever. He'd walk, walk onto the training pitch with his five little paper files. I'd be like, this is what they do at corners. Work on it. This is when they're attacking. He had it down to a T. He knew what they did. And then in the games, if it wasn't going right after 10, 15 minutes, he'd be up, up above and look down and he'd change it. He'd ring down and said, right, changing this. He was brilliant at it. Brilliant at it. You know, it's, it's like when he had the sweeper. People said he had three centre halves. Like even in the docu- document of 89, documentary of 89, they say, oh, he done that just for that game, for, for the uh, Anfield game. He didn't. His first time he'd done it was against Man United. He drew one each. He was getting ready for the Liverpool game. Right. So, yeah, so he'd done, that. he'd done it there. That's the first time. Because I remember, I remember filling for Lee Dixon, cause just in case he, be, you know, he won't make the make Old Trafford game. And, and then it, Dicko did, but yeah. He was like that. George was like that. And, and was he... I mean, people will have this... Uh, you know, they will think, you know, George Graham, hard taskmaster, you know, real attention to detail, probably dossiers on the opposition before that became fashionable. But was he an all-round manager? Was he a decent man-manager as well? Could he, could he uh, talk to you one-on-one and inspire? I wouldn't say he was an all-round manager. <laughs> George, was not a, George was definitely a great manager, tactically aware. He knew his players. But he wouldn't put his arm around you and talk to you for the problem. You know what I mean? He's definitely not one of those man managements. He's, he's definitely one of his skill. Because we felt like there's too many players. So um, he had his favourites. But all man- managers have their favourites. Uh, he the would just rule with an iron fist. And then he, did he employ good assistant managers who could do yeah. the arm around the shoulder? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like always. Great managers have this number two. Theo Foley was brilliant at that first. Theo, we loved Theo. The players loved Theo. And, you know, I mean, George knew, knew that. He didn't really care if they hated him. They feared him. As long as Theo was there, we could, somebody could talk to Theo. If you had any problems, you talk to Theo, and it gets back to him. Then he didn't say anything. And then Theo was, he sacked Theo. And then he brought in Stuart Houston. Nice fella. But it wasn't the same. But no one really cared about that, that same thing, the feeling about for Theo. Once Theo left, it was like, oh, I brought someone else in. You know what I mean? China, but, so it was like that. You know, but. And when, when did you last see George? Do you get on with him now? So I think you had an up and down relationship when you played for him, but do you get, do you get on with him? Uh, he's fine now. It's fine. I'll just tell him how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> but he's fine. You know, he's got arthritis. When I see him, I say hello, boss, or whatever. I've got great respect for him. Definitely, but we're not like friends, friends. We're not out for a drink or anything like that, or but you know, um, but no, mate. I got what, someone... about, what about the other teammates from uh, your Arsenal time? I mean, I think um, I think people automatically assume that footballers stay in touch with each other after the finished play, but it's not necessarily the case, is it? But have you got good friends in the game? Still? <laughs> oh yeah, as Coley, Andy Cole used to say, ships passing through the night. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, no, we've still got, we've got, we've got a WhatsApp group for the Arsenal boys, some of the Arsenal boys, uh, which is good. Um, no, nah, that's how it is. You just, you just see each other, you know, you just say hi or whatever. But you know, I've no, meet, you never get, get to meet up or anything like that, yeah. really. Who, send, who <laughs> sends the worst stuff on the WhatsApp group? The worst stuff? <laughs> Probably you, Mickey. Uh, it depends what you kind of mean by worst stuff, you see. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the right thing. I stopped sending them things ages ago. So. <laughs> so, 
Too mature for that. Too mature for that. Well, well let's, uh, let's go on to... The guys, the guys always sending things. And, you know, like, there'd be Kevin Campbell who's sending something. There'd be um, the captain who's sending Tony Adams to say something. Lee Dixon always sending something. Perry Groves always on it. Um, Smudger, Alan Smith has sometimes put in now and again. Just like Boldy now and again, the brandy drinker. So, uh, yeah. Well, well pop in now and again. Next time you see Alan Smith, can you remind him of this, right? I was I was on schoolboy forms at Doncaster Overs in 1988, and Doncaster played Arsenal in the final of the FA Youth Cup, right? You're kidding me! Hold on, you put for Doncaster. I wasn't playing in the I wasn't playing in the game. I was too young. I was 14, but I was in the schoolboys, so our team went to go and watch the final at Bellevue. I think it was over two legs. So Kevin Campbell was playing for Arsenal Youth yeah. Team, and I've never seen anything like it in my born days. He was so good, it was genuinely scary. And I think Arsenal beat us 6-1. I think Kevin scored about four goals. But I remember at half-time, I got my cup of Bovril because we'd heard that all the Arsenal first team were, were coming on this coach, were there. And there were... Um, no, it must have been at the end of the game. And uh, they were getting back on their own coach. Mm. And I went up to Alan Smith as a 14-year-old. I said, Alan, can, can I have your autograph? And he completely ignored me, right? And he stood at the front of the bus. And the bus door opened and hit him smack in the face. And I thought, <laughs> I thought it's karma for you, Smudger. So oh, remind me of that. Oh, you got to tell him that one. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> Please tell him that. Yeah. Oh, God damn. Oh, so you were there. Well, Brian Dean was there. Were you there then? Well, I was on schoolboy forms and Brian was in the first team. And, uh, yeah, Brian left that season, yeah. Mm. Yeah, he went to Sheffield United that season. But yeah, that was my memory of uh, of Alan Smith. And then I think the next time I saw him was Friday, May the 26th, 1989, when I was watching the game at Anfield with my dad. And there, Alan Smith scores to give you half a chance. Yes. And then all of a sudden, it's the uh, it's the Michael Thomas show. And you got away with a pretty rank first touch as well. Well, well, well steady on which one? Which one were the... Oh, the... When you tried to chip it over Steve Nichols' head. Oh, yeah. well, 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 I want a rank first touch. Is it bad? Oh, I couldn't get over his head. He hit his shoulder. It's a hey, fate. I can't I'm not gonna, What can I say? It's fate. It's, it's, hey, when the gods go with you, they're going with you. Hit, hit his shoulder, hit my shoulder. In the path I want to go in. What more? There you are. I'm, I'm there. I'm facing Bruce Grobler. What more do you say? Well, you, you put... Uh, all I was thinking as I was watching that on TV was, is he ever going to bother shooting? I, I thought you were taking so long. Do you still think that... I, I still watch that goal and I still think you're going to get tackled. Me too. Well, I've seen it a, few, a couple of times. Not, not less than five. I've seen it five, less than five times. I don't watch it anyway. Never watch it. Um, but yeah, I still feel like... Yeah, I can feel, feel it in the back of me. Oh, oh, weird. My body just... Oh, man. It's a weird feeling. It's a weird. Out of body feeling watching that. It's not right. It's not Is, nice. Is that just part of your laid-back character, the fact that you took so long? Uh, yeah, the lad will say, yes, definitely. That's, that's the Thomas, you know, where it yeah, hurt me. It's the anger of George Graham. He's get, he's get really peed off about it. <laughs> Mickey, Mickey, come on, son. Run down the way. Oh, Theo, get Mickey. Talk, get him. Get him. Get, get, get him here. I want him now. Get him up. Get him up. <laughs> What was the uh, what was the bus home like? That must have been crazy. Cause am I right in saying that you actually managed to get George Graham to the back of the bus? Yeah, no one can. We're like, what the hell? First time ever. What's George doing at the back of the bus? And for this long as well? But over an hour and a half, drinking champagne with us? Wow. We're like, oof. What the hell? Hey, enjoy it where you can. That's what. Never be seen again. We just enjoyed it. We just loved it. You know what I mean? Great time for us. So young to win the league, 21, most, most of us. So, yeah, it's like, wow, we've done it, 21. Yeah. And a lot of you would come through together, haven't you? You know, that, that young nucleus of players. Very, very much so. So it's quite weird. And it's weird when and I look back at the 71 team. They, were quite, they came through together as well, the 71 team. Charlie George, Ray Kennedy and all that. You know, it's, and then he scores a winning goal. At White Hart Lane, Ray Kennedy, 
and I scored the winning goal, and we both end up at Liverpool. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, if we only good thing about it, he's, he won more league championships than I ever won at Liverpool. <laughs> so yeah, he won a few, didn't he? He won a few. Oh, he's well, number five he shirt. Player yeah. he was. Oh, geez. And then you were all in champions in uh, Southgate that night. Apart from Lee Dixon, I, I think he had some family event to go to. So I hope he gets plenty of stick for that. But what were the what were the memories of uh, champions in Southgate? Because I think there were a load of fans there, weren't there as well? Yeah, I remember coming off the coach, going into the snooker club, and then after that, I haven't a clue what happened. Not a clue. Uh, I don't know what happened. I got home, having a Scooby. So it's kind of weird. It's all a blur to me now. Yeah. Very much a blur. So I, oh. I take it uh, uh, your missus and uh, young child would have accepted uh, you being away that night. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. It's going back to Streatham. Yeah, yeah. I think I would have thought so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we talk about Liverpool, I wanted to ask you about your kind of England career because you played through the, uh, the age group, schoolboys and all the rest of it, but only two... Yeah kind of full international caps. And and you made your debut in Saudi Arabia of all places. Yeah. What, what do you remember of that trip and being part of the setup under Bob Robson? That was a powerful nation, that was a footballing nation, that was Saudi Arabia. I tell you, four. <clears throat> what a team. They were t- <laughs> no, mate, to play against any national team, it's an honour. A- absolute honour. Um, and for me at that time, Steve McMahon, great player. Yeah, I don't think it was. Glenn Hoddle. Was Glenn Hoddle? No, Glenn Hoddle just, just left. Brian Robson would have been there. Uh, oh, amazing. So, um, he just wanted to blood young players after, obviously, the, the collapse of the European Championships in Holland. Mm. You know, so he said, that's, that's it, we're changing, we're changing. And the funny thing about that, the year before, we were on the, an England under-19 I think under 19 or under 20 uh, uh, tour to Brazil in South America. And Don Howe and Brian Robson, uh, Bobby Robson took, took it, the, the, the trip. And all the players on there said, right, if you want to get in the first, the first, te- first team, we want to see how good you are on this trip. I was playing full back then. So, like, every time I was playing football, I was bombing, scoring. But, but like, Brazilians going, Josima, Josima, oh, Josima. And Bob Robson put me aside later on in, in the hotel or whatever, about that trip, and said, we know you could get into the first team. Just keep doing what you're doing. But I was a fullback. So, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> to, what, two years later, I'm playing, I'm playing midfield, scoring. I'm, I'm in the England squad. Like, whoa, whoa. Some part of England squads training quite a few England squads, never coming, never, never making it to the, the bench or anything. But just being a part of it, it's like wow, amazing, amazing. Yeah, that and was then, a good time. And you, you were leading up to Italian ninety, weren't you? I mean, were you thinking that you know I'm going to get a slot on the plane here? Yeah, it was games. Oh god, very much so. Because playing in the uh, the B team in under twenty ones, I was like, oh, might you might get a slot. Never know. You never know. You never know. Gaza was doing well. Um, I was doing well. Platy was doing well. So no one knew what was going on. No one knew. And I think uh, George at that time didn't want me to do too well because obviously wage contract contracts would come into it. You know. And I was like, oh god. He hated when any of us Arsenal boys went to international duty to find out what other players are getting on, getting in the wages. So Arsenal were quite low, weren't they, in terms of the grand oh, things? It was an embarrassment. It was an embarrassment when we were getting paid. Because our love for the club, we, 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 I was going to say we didn't care, we, we did care. <laughs> it's like, I can't believe this. We're doing so well. The club's making money. They're starting to get busy. The cra- crowds are coming back. And we're getting paid pennies. Well, give us a, com- give us a comparison then, because it's 31 years. So 1989, right. you're the league winners. What were you earning? Uh, league winners when I when I came a league winner uh, about 250 300 quid 250 300 quid a week right okay and right. so when when, when you I, my there? first contract was my first pro contract I was earning 150 the second contract was 200 
So they get much. Next one was 300. And the last contract I signed was 400 pound a week. Wow. And I stayed in that contract to, to, to run it out. Four years, I was like, not gonna. Uh, there's, Arsenal were quite smart, were smart in them days. I never had an agent. So I had a solicitor at the time, but it didn't do, it didn't do enough, good enough job at the time to go from like, you know, 400 quid for four years. And also, folks crafty, clubs are crafty. They were signing you after about a year or two, another put you up 100 quid. It's like, if, it was F all, really. Yeah. So I stayed my, that 400 quid for four years, for four years. I wouldn't sign, I wouldn't budge. That's what we fell out of George with that, really. George was like, get me out of the team. I don't care about him. God reserves, go and train for the kids and whatever. All right, yeah, whatever. And then it, next one, it'd be pulling me in. If you thought about your contract, why am I signing the contract if I'm going to train the kids in reserves or whatever? It used to. Oh, go back, go back. And that was it. Back and forth. Have you decided, have you changed your mind? Hell no. Hell no. And then I met Dennis Roach. Dennis Roach said, right, I think a few clubs in Italy want to take you. But um, I don't think Jules going to let you go. If he ain't going to let you go, but ask for this amount of money. For so two years, a year or two, George was like, no, 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 no. I said, okay, fine. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> and then that's it. I left at Christmas before my contract was up for the summer. And I, and I was ready to, you know, go all the way to the summer and go to a tribunal. Yeah. Yeah, but that's how, that's how it worked back then, wasn't it? So if, if you were out of contract, clubs could still sell you, but the fee was decided by a tribunal. So there was no player power back then, was there? It no, was no player, player power. power. They could offer you what they want in the last minute and say, oh, we offered you a contract. Contract could be, hold on, a bit late. We've been fighting for a year or two over contracts, you know? They forget about that, you know? It's player power now. They go, oh, yeah, too much player power. The clubs had all the power. Sometimes you couldn't play. You were young. You're basically on guarding leaf. You just didn't play. You know, you put, you know, I remember they put Paul Davis when I left. He, he fell out of George. The year Arsenal nearly got relegated, it, George didn't play him at all. When, then they had to, he, had to, he, had to go to, he had to go cap in hand to Paul Davis, please come and play. Paul played, made a big, massive difference. Got him to the Cup Winners' Cup final. You know, obviously, I think they lost to uh, the list. Oh, wasn't it? No, nah, Saragossa. I think probably Saragossa that one. Oh yeah, it could be. It could be the Palmer game or the Par- Saragossa. And he's like, that's how he treated the player. Who'd been there through the ranks and done so well for him. I'm yeah. like, so you'd reached the end of your tether with that situation in sort of late 1991. Um, so why Liverpool? It wasn't meant to be Liverpool. It wasn't like that. Liverpool uh, came in, Man City came in, Aston Villa came in, and I said no to them two. And then Liverpool came in again. It's like, Siri, I want, I want to sign you. I said, I don't, I'd rather wait till summertime. He's like, I can't wait till that time. I want you now. I need to sort it now. So we met him. The club said, said we could go, you can allowed to meet him. So we met him. See what he got to say, what, what he's going to do for the club and how he's going to build it. Um, I was really, imp- very impressed, and it was like, okay, let's sort it, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. And what what kind of reception did you get from the fans and in the dressing room after your heroics two years before? Oh, it's got it got a mixed reception, obviously, uh, on the on the terraces. You know, there's good and some bad. The blue side was nice to me, very much nice to me. Best day of their life, they said, as they said. <laughs> The red sides, uh, effing and blinding, but nah, they were brilliant. It, the red side were good, really great to me. Um, but the players, you know, as players do, like anyone, uh, they're like, welcome to the club. How much you, how much you getting? How much you earning? <laughs> it's like, like, ah, nice. <laughs> so, you know. Oh, so they do talk about that just to make sure they're not being stitched up. Oh, that's the first, first thing they said, you know, it was like, how much you getting? Obviously, they didn't say what I'm getting, but it's like, you know, I was like, oh, oh nice. It lived, I asked them, we never spoke about contracts. They were like, straight into it, bang. How much are you getting? What, you know, what's he giving you? Yeah. 
And I think I think Graham Sooners has now said that the biggest regret he's had in football is what he did at Liverpool uh, as a manager. You were obviously in the thick of that. Do you think he did try and change too much too soon? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because when I first went and spoke about things, I thought he was going to be the Liverpool way. You buy players, but then they have to learn a trade and watch what the, you know, the first team players are doing, really doing it, and learn from that. And then you get moved up into the first team. But he was like, no, nah, I'm totally new, new broom, get everybody out. I'm doing it. And it's, you can't do that. I don't think you can do that. I don't think Alex, Alex did that. You need to take time with the, the players and then bring them in. So that was, he always, he always regretted that. Because when I was in Portugal, he said that he should never have done that. should never have done that so quick. Because some, there's so much quality in that, in that squad. They still could have won the league the next year. And they didn't. Because he got rid of so many players. Because he fell out of arguments or, or stupidness, really. Yeah. You know, they, had a lot, they had a lot to give still, even at their, that age, or 30s or whatever. And do you think he just wanted to stamp his authority? And did he think that some of the senior players who were already there and winning things maybe had that little bit too much power and he might be undermined? Yeah, I think it probably would have been that. But I don't think, you know, because he's been the player there before. So he knows what Liverpool's all about. So I don't know why he's going to have to change too much. If he didn't get on with some players, just tell him. Mm. But he's still going to have to respect him. I don't understand why he did that. But it's different to George Graham. He came in. He's seen the team hasn't won anything for, for years. He went, right, get everybody out, all the old players out. They keep the ones you want to work with and some you don't want to work with. Mm-hmm. You know? So could you feel maybe that the old Liverpool was slipping, slipping away the longer you were there? Uh, yes, very much so. Um, you know, you always learn from your elders and it was it's tough. There wasn't many elders. Ronnie Whelan was... Like the elder statesman, Ian Rush, and John Barnes, Jan Mulby. So for them, it was like, oh, and Bruce Grubler and Stephen Nichols. So he had still a great core, but they're always injured. Mm-hmm. That's on the downside. Barry Venison was there. Uh, so, yeah, it's a shame, really, because you had a great core of players. Very great core of players. Um, but but it, was, it was in that era maybe for the first time in ge- a generation, that Liverpool's buying poly- or uh, their acquisitions were poor. They made a lot of poor signings, didn't they? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> if, remember oh, Shunas. Name names, yeah. by the way. No, no, Shunas came from Glasgow Rangers. You could do it at Rangers, Glasgow Rangers. You know what I mean? You can buy who you want and still try and win, do well win the league. In Liverpool, you can't buy so many players in one season. And try and, and still try and win the league. It's like, come on now, you need to need them to bed in, you know. So that was always the hardest thing, really, trying to get everybody bed in. You had um, obviously Mark Wright, Dean Saunders, Mark Waters at the start, Isvan Kosma. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Then I came in Christmas time, um, and we all tried to all play in first team football, where the regulars were sometimes in, mostly injured. And it's always tough. I think it's always tough. If we're learning from them players, you know, we're yeah. different. Yeah. But what, uh, did you feel like you'd settled in on the pitch, that, that you were getting into that kind of Liverpool system? Yeah, I thought we were all getting into Yeah, it's easy. Once you start to play where you're doing training, one touch, two touches, it's quite very easy. Very easy. Then at one stage, I think we beat Oldham in Boundary Park. And then... Um, I thought, oh, we've got a chance here to come up the league and win the league here. Then more injuries came. So I was like, oh, you know. Yeah. Shame, really. May United pushed Leeds. We beat May United in the last day or whatever it was. Yeah. And then also Leeds won their game against Sheffield. Yeah. 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 But then um, in, injuries were becoming more of a problem for you. Was the, was the one that really set you back in your time at Liverpool? Achilles. When I first arrived, they said, do not touch Phil Borsma. And like, we're on about. Wherever he, wherever he touches, gets injured. And that was, that was a string of Achilles. Achilles were just going nonstop. Everyone's getting Achilles. Snapping Achilles or whatever. And it's like, weird. I thought, yeah, whatever. A year later, my Achilles goes. I had it cleaned first. And then next minute, it snapped high up. Um, 
So yeah, I didn't know until later on that I could have retired on, on my Achilles because they've never seen it. Uh, it's not so high up before. Wow. So yeah, so I had about over a year bit of rehab down at Lillyshaw and then back at the club. I mean, that must have been horrendous rehab. And then you come back and obviously John Barnes has reinvented himself as a central midfielder. You've got Jimmy <laughs> Redknapp coming through and yeah. the picture can't have looked particularly rosy for you. No, it didn't. It's just like, oh gosh, but hey, I'm just pleased to get back more than anything. Still have a career. And that's my, that was my own, only goal at the time. Just mm. keep trying to work and keep have faith in what you're doing in the rehab. And the best thing I went was, was going to Lily Show. You know, the National Rehab Centre in Shropshire is fantastic. Just get away from it all every day. Especially when you're in the, in the gym, you're watching them train every day and just drives you mad. You just, it's, not, it's not good. It's not good being around it. So at least you're there with familiar people, same people who've got injuries, all want to try and, you know, get back fit again. Who else was there at the time at Lily Shaw? Any, any, any known names who you were trying to rehab with? Well, yes, yeah, plenty. Because over there for a year, so yeah. <laughs> Vinnie Jones came. My mate Perry Groves was there. Then there was um, ah oh, bloody hell, excuse my language. Uh, McClare, not McClare. What's his name? Oh, God, Rangers at the forwards. Gordon Jury, Ali McCoist. Ali McCoist, that's the main round. Ali McC- I'm, I'm, I'm losing it, I'm just losing it. What was Ali McCoist doing getting treatment at Lily Shaw as a Scot? I, they, I think they just heard about the National Rehab Centre. Okay. You know? One of the Scots, one of the Scots uh, medics, he worked for the Olympics and he worked at Rangers as well before. So, like, he just probably told Rangers because he was coming down to there and he was, you know, it was amazing. It was amazing. Bike riding, you think it's like easy bike riding, but it's like you're always on a, always on a timer. There's always a forfeit for anything if you're late for anything. If you're late coming into the hall, you had to do roll 500 meters in a certain time. You know, if, you know, if you're late getting back from the bike ride on a swim or whatever, uh, forfeits all the time. Yeah. No, but no, it was good. And also, there's a lot. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Later that, there's drinking there. In the, in the bar at the end. <laughs> is, that, is that what it was? So you do your rehab during the day and have a few pints with Vinny? Do the pints, but then you obviously can't get too messed up because you're back early in the morning, you're back on it again. You know, and then Friday came and you was like, they let you go at, off at lunchtime to go home. And it's like, it was like, can't wait, we're going home. For it. And the Friday, get, oh, it's like look, looking at the clock. You're there. And it's, oh, get in your car and try and just beat the traffic. You know, I mean, get on. Yeah. Oh, driving a car with a snap to get, you know, a, a rehab Achilles tendon must be fun. But you... Yeah, yeah. I used to drive a car with my Achilles in plaster. I had automatic, so it was easy. <laughs> you know, it wasn't meant to, but you, you do things. To... <laughs> yeah. And like I said before, you, you came back from injury, which is, you know, big props to you coming back from Achilles tendons and you won another couple of medals, didn't you, at Liverpool, but not not regular enough to to maybe want to stay. But tell us about your overseas adventure in uh, Portugal with Benfica. How did that come about? Oh, Benfica. Sooners tried to, to get me there and I was like, I'm not, uh, I don't know about going to Benfica. I've heard the stories, not getting paid on time. I'm like, Ugh. and then Brian Dean keeps ringing me and my mate Brian Dean's ringing me. Oh, Mickey, you've got to come over, mate. Come over. It's great life. Oh, great life over it. You love it. You love it. First thing I said to Dino, Dino, do you get paid on time? There's a pause. Yeah, you definitely get paid, paid on time. You definitely get paid on time. You get paid on time. Never to go without. I said, Dino, you're sure? Because I'm not coming over. I've still got, con- I still got a few years of my contract still to go at Liverpool. No, no, no. We get paid on time. We get paid on time. Get there. Six weeks, I'm waiting for my wages. I'm like, I say, like, oh, what the hell I let myself in for? Like, oh. But uh, the lifestyle was good. The football was like, I would say, like a championship. Really? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, was uh, it... Um, uh, the, grounds, the grounds are like the third division, fourth division, some of the grounds. Uh, shocking. 
It was shocking. I mean, it's, not a, it's not a league that I've ever paid much attention to, but I suppose in the back of my mind, I thought, well, it must be, you know, quite technical out there, is it? Very technical. It's mm. all like, you know, the players, all the players are technical. And it's great, you know, to see them, you know, we've been watching the young kids training at Benfica, schoolboys, very technical. Um, and when they play, I remember when they played England, the people were saying, oh, England has beat them. I said, you might beat them with stamina, technic- technicality, not a chance. They've got a lot of players who are technically good. So it depends how you, you approach the game in the Euros. Yeah. So, but then Sooner seemed to be trying to mould a team in his image and he signed about half a dozen British players. <laughs> I don't know what he's done. He signed six players, whatever, yeah. He signed a lot of players. It was like, wow. The British contingent, and they I don't think they like that really. Obviously, the Portuguese didn't like that. too many English in the club. One club, we were about six of us at one time. Yeah, like, there, was, there was you, Steve Harkness, Mark Pembridge, Scott Minto, Brian Dean, and Dean Saunders. I mean, that is a that is a big British invasion, isn't it? And Gary Charles. And Gary Charles, yeah, it must have rubbed people up the wrong way. <laughs> no, it is, yeah, yeah. So that's like, like oh god, you know. And you go, I would say. The good thing about that, <laughs> they all had agents. <laughs> I was the only one who had no agent. So when they was all leaving, I knew that I'll be, <laughs> I'll be still there. <laughs> so I was like, oh god. So yeah. Yeah, you stuck around for the year, I didn't you? But... For over a year, yeah, to find it out. You know, not not getting paid for a year. So yeah. Oh, Enjoyed a contract if I left. How am I enjoyed a contract when they not paid me for a year? I couldn't work it. I was like, so I had to stick it out. So you have to stick it out in Lisbon, not being yeah. paid. Yeah, and not being paid, you know, what? living off the savings. And then obviously when I, would, when I come back to England, that's fight out with the, uh, you know, FIFA. FIFA got my money back. Oh. It's a, it was a joke. It's embarrassing. Our, our clubs can get away with it. And big clubs as well. I mean, this Benfica yeah, yeah. are a European powerhouse, or supposedly. Yeah, yeah. They're a joke, man. They were, it was a disgrace. It was a disgrace. Yeah, and but on the pitch, I think, pitch, I, on I the think pitch. that's why I, I think that's why um, players, foreign players, love coming to England. They used, you know, could you get paid on time? They're never used to that. You know, abroad, it's like you want to get paid. Depends what the, the chairman wants. It was like, you know, but in England, we're getting paid on time, and now it's changing again. Like, look at it now. All the foreign owners, some, they've been like that now. It's paying when they want to pay. It's wrong. Yeah. And on the pitch, you were keeping players like Deco and Manish out of the team. So I can't imagine the fans were too happy with that. I don't know. I never met Deco. Deco had gone before. I think Deco and Manish were on loan or somewhere. I don't know. I didn't even know. I didn't even met, never met, met him. So, you know, it's quite strange. So, if, if you'd have been paid properly, do you think you'd have really enjoyed it out there? And would it have suited you, the lifestyle and everything else? My lifestyle was great. Uh, I definitely enjoyed it. Definitely enjoyed it. Football was fine. I just thought the politics is crap, really. You know what I mean? Politics is obviously player power in, in the dressing room, the Portuguese against the English. It's just trying to make it into a separate thing. And it, sometimes it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Because we got on with everyone, really. You know, I remember we had Carol Poboski there. It was there. So it was, it was good, yeah, good fun. You had some Russians. Yeah, no, we had a good laughs, but I don't understand why. You know, I fell out of them. They took exception to me, the crowd. I don't know why, but anyhow, anyhow, hey ho. Yeah. So you decided to go to Wimbledon. What was all that about? Oh, because my ex reserve manager and youth team slash reserve manager, Terry Burton, he was at Wimbledon. And uh, he asked me to come to Wimbledon. And I was, I'm in an hour whether to go to Wimbledon or Ipswich. My wife just had a baby. So we're thinking, if I go to London, it's ideal because she knows London. I know London. I'm fine. Ipswich, I can't see it. That's a journey from, from the, the, the world to Ipswich. Ipswich from the Premiership. And I thought, under George Burley, and I thought, uh, I'll, I'll go to Wimbledon. Be easier then. I can get get them, get them up. It'd be nice to get them up. Obviously, wrong choice. Fell out of them. They wanted to change. They were the way they were playing. The ethos of no long ball, more through midfield. Get there, 
first few training sessions, yeah, 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 games, play for midfield. Get to a game, it's gone over my head. I'm like, what, what we're doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? What, what's the point of me being here? <laughs> and that's like, it, it's, it's just changed. I was like, you know, oh well. I feel like the manager there, same thing again. Another year of just doing nothing. Yeah. And was it still that crazy gang spirit? Because I know they've been relegated. There was all that. Could you sense it was a real club in decline? It was a change. The club, not to say decline, but is it, the club was changing. You know, um, Terry Brent was trying to change it. Thatcher was just about to leave to go to Spurs. Um, Jason Yule was left to go to Charlton. Um, Hearts was doing well at the start. And then he went. I think he went to, where did he go to? Uh, Celtic. Ham, didn't he? Eh? Or Coventry or West Ham. I, mean, I, I, thought he went, I thought he went to Celtic or something. I thought he went, went up there. I don't know where he went, but yeah. Could be West Ham or whatever. So it's just, it, it's just weird. There's always, you know, everything was changing. You know, the ethos was changing. So. Oh no, he was at West Ham before. You're absolutely right. Yeah, he probably went on to Celtic. So, so you had a year basically on the sidelines. What was that like at sort of 32, 33? And was it just literally playing for the reserves? Yeah, playing for the reserves, trying to humiliate me in front of them. I won't give in. I've just done, I've just done a year. Portugal. Hmm. Forget that now. I'm I'm in England now. I'm, I'm home. I can do what I want now. I'm just if I'm not even, if I'm not playing, I just sit at home, go out at nights, meet friends in London, chill out, whatever. And then you know, then they try to humiliate me by say, all right, come to games if you don't play in the first team. So still, still have to come to games. When he knew I had a young family up in in the world, and I would go go on on a Friday. And they'd be like, oh, you come to games on a Saturday. So I went, okay. I'll show my face. I'll show my face, show my face, and they'll drive on, drive up. You know, it's just been, it's just been awkwardness. I don't know what he's trying to, he was trying to do, humili- humiliate me. I just said, yeah, sod you. Yeah. Yeah. And do you get quite a bit of that in football, more than people realise? Yeah, you do. Yeah. It's very, very much so, it goes on, trying to humiliate you just to get you to leave or whatever. Yeah. Yes, enough. But then you made the decision to, to walk away. You're only 33. I mean, do, were you thinking that you wanted to play, continue to play, or had you I fallen out of love with it? Play. I thought I'd oh, go to crew, just train at crew. Then I'm training at Blackburn. I want to continue to play, see if I can, could still play. I've missed two years of, yeah, you know, two and a half, three years of football. Yeah, you know, but, but obviously it wasn't to be. So, uh, you know what? I didn't want to go down to non-league. Um, could have gone to Wrexham. You know, but yeah, I just said, you know what? Give it. I, just can't, I can't be asked now. I'm done. I'm mm. done. Yeah. And did you want to stay in the game? Did you want to do coaching badges and all that? I wanted to do coaching badges at the time. I was, was going to do coaching badges. I was at Liverpool Academy. I was going in there. Stevie Highway was fantastic. He said, come in whenever you want and just learn from us. You know, I was doing that, doing a little few sessions. Um, and then my mum died and that hit me hard. And I thought it hit me that hard, but it did hit me really hard. I could, couldn't be asked for anything. Mm. Kept the arse doing anything. Yeah. Um, and so was, that was me. That was it for me. That was me done. But, you know, I still like, obviously, I still love to be around the football world, mm. not as a coach, but just advisor, you know, as a young players, just be there to be a sounding board from, yeah. me, you know, obviously what I've been through. Yeah. Tell them what, I can tell them what, you know, do's and don'ts or whatever. It's yeah, like, definitely. Definitely. And do you, do you keep in contact with the modern game? You still love the game in terms of watching it and, and being involved and kids playing it? Yeah, very much so. I still love the game, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's good at the, looking on the outside, looking in, just enjoying it. It's a lot, there's obviously, there's a lot going on now. It's all changed now, isn't it? So, but who knows? Football world, you never know. It changes so quickly. It's just you know, it's weird. You know, you get a phone call tomorrow. I might say, oh, can you come in and advise some young kid or whatever? You never know. Yeah, yeah. and just finally, Mickey, um, if a young player is listening to this who didn't have the pleasure of seeing you play. 
back in the day, what modern player would you compare yourself to? So they've got a picture in the head. Oh, I would say, uh, people asked me that question before, I would say uh, like a Fernandinho. I could read the game. Uh, I play within myself. I didn't need to go, you know, be extravagant because once you read the game, it's easy. You can always, you know, and then just pass the ball to the better players who can do, do a bit. I knew I could do a bit, but I don't need to. McAlelly was the same. He, he, he had a lot of talent, but he didn't need to show much. You know, he could read the game, pass somebody else. And look what happened to when he left Madrid. They it just fell down. That's because of the, the owner. He wanted Galacticos. He didn't understand the game. The players did. Because they knew what he did for the, for the team. You know, you're the unsung hero. I'm yeah. going to be out the limelight. Leave it to the other guys that don't do, you know, get, get the light shined on them. Yeah. They do a bit more. I'm happy. Got no, my... Mickey, Fernandinho, Thomas. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> I love that. I love that. You know, oh, I love that. You know, I love to have played. Love to have played under uh, uh, Arsene Wenger. You well, know. you just missed out, didn't you? Well, you, funnily enough, you nearly went back to Arsenal, didn't you, under Bruce Rioch in the mid nineties? Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's, the, that's the one weird thing. Nearly went back to 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 Arsenal. Steve Burch rung me up, rung me up and said, "Right, uh, the manager wants to know: Would you would you come back?" So yeah, I'm, I'll come back. Definitely, I'm not even playing now and again. I'll come back. Okay, I'll, t- I'll tell him. I'll tell him. Didn't hear nothing. Another one, Chelsea, Glenn Hoddle, my good mate, uh, good mate at the time, used to manager. Was now it was assistant manager, Gwyn Williams. Who brought me? It was, it was at Chelsea with. He goes, uh, Mickey. This is in the night time. One night, bring me. Do you want to come to Chelsea? Gaffer wants you at Chelsea. Yeah, yeah. I called Chelsea, definitely, no problem. Okay, next minute, next morning, it breaks. Michael Thomas, hit little thing. Michael Thomas to Chelsea. Glenn Hodder goes mad with Gwyn Williams. He spoke and he said nothing. Because how could he, and he spoke to him late last night. How the hell can he speak to anybody? Now he's spoken to someone. What happened? Hacking, all the hacking thing. The phone hacking, you got involved. Yeah, all the hack, they hacked all that, yeah. So people, no. manager, he might got his phone hacked. And, you know what I mean? So that's how they, they that's how the press find, find out about things. Wow. So were they hacking your phone or you think hacking the coach's phone? Well, hacking Glenn Hoddle's phone or whatever. And wins or whatever of football. They hacked so many phones. It was, in, it was rife. No one knew about it. All the stories were coming out. We didn't know where it come from. And Gwyn was saying to him, he never spoke to no one. I could sweat my life on it. He didn't speak. And Glenn Hoddle's going, no, no, I'm not having it now. He's, he's let it out. So, so you missed out on a move to Chelsea, a team yeah. you used to watch when you were a kid because of phone hacking. <laughs> yeah. It was just, yeah, it was crazy. Fucking crazy. Absolutely crazy. You know? That is, that is just so bizarre, isn't it? How, how things could have changed. And it's these little butterfly moments in life, isn't it? You know, it's like if you'd have forced that move through to Portsmouth when you're a kid, would all yeah. this have happened, you know? Exactly, you know. Then I, find, then I find that later on, I could have gone to Spurs before I made the Arsenal team, before I made the Arsenal first team. Peter Shrees wanted me to come there. Arsenal wanted to sell me there. <laughs> it's like, wow. It was cra- it's crazy, isn't it? It's yeah. bad world, you, could, you, know. you could have played alongside Glenn Oddle. There you go. Oh, oh, imagine good. that being idle. Even Auss- Aussie as well. Jeez. Fantastic. Oh. Nice one. Yeah, crazy times. Could have been crazy times. The only time I went to Arsenal, to watch Arsenal, was when Kevin Keegan came back. All my pals went going to Arsenal, going to watch Arsenal. Keegan's Keegan's back. It was massive, fifty five thousand. I'm in the North Bank. I can't breathe. And I'm seeing this Kevin Keegan making his return to English football. I'm like, what the hell? That was that would have been That's the only time I went to Arsenal. To what to watch them as a kid? Are you talking yeah, about nineteen eighty yeah. or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To watch them. At the time, Arsenal weren't the best to watch, were they? It wasn't a flamboyant team to watch. So I was like, nah. So, yeah. Yeah, so that would have been when he came back um, for Southampton. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Just seeing him, like, being amongst that crowd, just, like, seeing Keegan. Wow. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Good times. Right, Mickey, I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you ever so much. Speak to you soon. Definitely. Take care, pal. Enjoy. 
Thank you very much indeed to Mickey. What an amazing journey he's been on. And just to think he was picking up just a couple of hundred quid a week when he was winning titles for Arsenal. A little bit different to the multiple thousands the top players of today are trousering. It was a very different era indeed, wasn't it? Now, if you've got any comments or ideas for interviewees, then tweet me at Richard Lenton. Loads more ex-players will be telling their footballers' live stories in the coming weeks. So make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you soon. Footballers' Lives was brought to you by the Phoenix Sport and Media Group. www.psm-group.co.uk